I always thought Arizona was flat desert with lots of cactus. I had no idea it had so many mountains. And those pine trees. I never expected pine trees. Oh. oh, sorry about this turbulence, Kathy. I tried to go higher, but this plane isn't performing very well. This last leg, it seems like it's really been struggling. I just don't have power. I, I, I can't seem to climb. of those mountains. Bob! Um, I'm not really sure, honey. Those pine trees are getting bigger. Are we in trouble? Just turn around. Bob, what's happening? Hello, fellow pilots. I'm John King. And I'm Martha King. Welcome to Making Your Own Rules developing your personal minimums checklist for real-world flying. You know, we've been in situations similar to that one, and we've experienced the same kind of stress that pilot did. And so have most pilots who've got very much experience. You know the feeling. You get me out of this situation, and I promise I'll never do that again. Well, it's not very much fun. Most of us resolve never to get in that situation again. But then it happens to some pilots over and over. We all know someone whose family won't fly with him or her anymore. And we know a few pilots who've scared themselves so badly they've given up flying altogether. That's a shame. It doesn't have to be that way because you can do something about it. Most stressful and dangerous situations that occur in the air come about because of bad decisions or failure to even make decisions right here on the ground. Incidents and accidents often occur because during our pre-flight planning, we fail to consider some factor critical to the success of the flight. And this occurs even when we do a thorough pre-flight, just as we've been taught. What we are going to do today is work together to help you develop your own personal minimums checklist. It'll be an easy to use personal tool tailored to your own situation to let you fly with less stress and less risk. We are all in the habit of using checklists in the air. We know it helps to make sure we don't overlook anything. What we are talking about doing now is using the same kind of quick checklist on the ground before you go as part of your pre-flight planning to make sure you don't overlook anything. We call the things that can cause problems for a flight risk factors. Here are the four major categories of risk factors that your checklist will cover so you can think about them before you leave. The pilot. For example, how current are you? How rested are you? Do you have experience with the kind of airspace you'll be flying in? Experience with the terrain? The aircraft, is it properly equipped and capable for this flight? What if it's a night flight or a flight in the mountains? The environment, what's the weather like? Is it day or night? What terrain will this trip be over? External pressures, why are you making the trip? What external forces are pushing you to get there at a certain time? Do you have an important business meeting scheduled? Are you flying to a family get-together? Or maybe the most important event of all, your high school class reunion? If you have any trouble remembering these risk factors, just think PAVE, as in pilot, aircraft, environment, 
and external pressures. Use your personal minimums checklist to pave the way for a safe and comfortable flight. Using your personal minimums checklist is going to take some practice. Did you ever notice how easy it is to pick out the risk factors in somebody else's flight after the fact, but how hard it is to spot our own risk factors before and during the flight? Most of us just don't have the habit of identifying risk factors. Plus, we need to develop the skill of making proper decisions to control those risks before we fly. What I'd like you to do now is watch this next scenario with me as the pilot we saw earlier gets ready for that trip. Try to identify the risk factors you see and put them in their proper categories. Okay, thanks very much. Appreciate the help. Bye. I got the sandwiches. Ah, good. Kathy, you know how I've never flown west of the Mississippi before? This trip, we're really heading out to the wild, wild west. What do they say about the weather? Is it going to be bumpy again? Not really. The weather should be great. Should be good VFR the entire way. And the last time you said it would be good VFR, it was bumpy the whole time. It really should be good VFR. At the very worst, we might have to deal with a little rain. The briefer called it uh, Virga. It's, it's rain that doesn't even reach the ground. But will it be bumpy? All right, it might be a little bumpy. There's a pretty strong wind coming out of the southwest. But it really shouldn't slow us down. It's almost a complete crosswind. Here, let me show you the route. This is going to be great. All right, we start here in El Paso. We follow the road up to Deming, then to Silver City, and then we use this little road as our guide all the way up to Springerville. That looks like a pretty small town. Is the airport going to be big enough? Kathy, we're only flying a Cessna 172. Look, this runway is 8,400 feet. That's plenty of runway for us. I'll go call Jim and Sue. What time should I tell them we'll be there? Uh, six o'clock should be fine. Okay. All right, thanks. Okay, Jim, hold on. Bob! We have a problem. Jim says the airport closes at 5. Hmm, let me talk to him. Hey, Jim, it's Bob. How you doing? Good, good. The flying's going great. Yeah, I've got almost 100 hours now. In fact, I'm going to start working on my instrument rating as soon as we get back from this trip. Anyway, what's this about the airport closing at 5? Oh, I see. It's the FBO that closes at 5. Well, that's not a problem. We can still land there. I'll tell you what. Why don't you and Sue meet us outside the FBO? Yeah, I know there's no phone or anything out there, but don't worry. We'll be there at 6 o'clock sharp. Yeah, the weather's great. We're not going to have a problem. Okay. Good. We'll see you at 6 o'clock sharp. All right. Bye. Wow, what a great day to fly. Now that we've identified the risk factors for this particular flight, we need to make some decisions about how to control those risks. Well, one way to control risks is to set your own personal minimums for each category of risk factor when it's appropriate. Now, the FAA has already established some minimums for many of these categories, but you should give yourself permission to be more conservative. I call that conservatism without guilt. You know, some pilots feel that they're not a fully qualified pilot unless they're willing to go right down to the FAA minimums in every situation. Well, that's not a good idea because of the philosophy behind the regulations. They're designed to be flexible and permissive. For instance, you can legally fly VFR at night, even in the mountains, with as little as three miles visibility and a 1,000-foot ceiling. But would you really want to do that? Would you consider that fun? or maybe stressful. Well, if you'd consider it stressful, it's probably not a wise thing to do. The regulations allow VFR flight at night in that kind of weather because in some circumstances it might be okay. And the philosophy is to allow pilots to exercise their own judgment. So set your own personal minimums for night VFR flight in the areas in which you fly. And even for flat country, you might want higher night VFR minimums than the FAA requires. Five miles visibility might be more comfortable for you. Now notice we're stressing personal minimums. 
The reason the minimums are personal is that you are a unique individual. Only you have your particular set of skills and abilities, and only you can make the right decisions for you. Now, in addition to ceiling and visibility, other areas in which you might want to set personal minimums are, first of all, the maximum crosswind component you'll take off or land in. You might consider a maximum of 75% of the demonstrated crosswind capability of the aircraft. And how about a percent margin over computed takeoff distance required? You know, the books assume a new airplane, a maximum performance effort, and a really sharp pilot. And it gives no margin at all for error. Well, we know sometimes we're not all that sharp. So we add 50% to the takeoff distance required for single-engine airplanes. Another area is recency of experience. The FAA regulations say you only need a biannual flight review and if you want to carry passengers three takeoffs and landings in the last 90 days. Now, you can have not flown for almost two years, go out and do three takeoffs and landings on your own, and then legally go out and fly even with passengers whenever you want. But do you really want to do that? A personal minimum to consider is if you've not flown for over six months, get some proficiency training with an instructor before you fly. Now another area to think about is stress. There is no question your concentration and your performance go downhill if you're under stress. And stress can come from having an argument with a relative or co-worker and from someone close to you having a serious illness and other major events in your life. The FAA does list medical conditions that require you to ground yourself, but stress is not one of them. So some pilots have a personal minimum of 24 hours between a significant argument with someone and a flight, just to calm down and make sure that they don't behave impulsively when they fly. For IFR pilots, consider having a personal minimum for the weather for takeoff. The FAA allows zero zero even for single engine airplanes at night under Part 91, but the airlines can't go unless they can return if they have a problem. So Martha and I always make sure that we can land within 20 minutes of takeoff. Now the FAA sets no limits on how many instrument approaches you can do when you're IFR, but we feel that repeated missed approaches encourage the tendency to cheat. So we have a rule of making no more than two instrument approaches to an airport before we go somewhere else. Now, in some cases, you can't really set minimums, but you can establish good operating procedures. The airlines refer to what I call good operating procedures as standard operating procedures, or SOPs. And one place where using standard operating procedures can be particularly helpful is in dealing with the external pressures of a flight. For instance, in the airlines, there's always pressure on an airline crew to reach the destination on time. One way this pressure is handled is by having an operations manual that spells out specifically the airline's requirements to dispatch or to continue a flight and the procedures the crew must follow. Corporate aviation pilots also have standard operating procedures, or SOPs, designed for their own operations. These SOPs describe how the crew should interact and what the normal routine of a flight should be. As a general aviation pilot, you're already using some standard operating procedures, such as using checklists for different phases of flight and the flow pattern you use when doing your pre-flight but you can lean on what the airlines and corporate aviation have already done by developing and using more of your own standard operating procedures. Part of your personal SOP to cope with external pressures might be to always allow extra time on a trip so that you have time to make extra fuel stops or unexpected landings due to weather and still not be late. It might be to always have alternative plans for late arrival. It could be to always have backup airline reservations or plan to leave early enough that you still have time to drive on trips that are really important to you. Just like you always leave yourself an out for weather and other factors in the air, 
your standard procedure should be to always leave yourself an out for the external pressures of a flight. Always tell folks who are expecting you that you'll be conservative and might not show up on time. After all, people get delayed on the airlines or in cars, too. You shouldn't be so eager to prove your skill and the utility of a light plane that you're unwilling to allow yourself that same out at all times. It isn't necessarily someone or something waiting for you at the destination that puts pressure on you to make a flight when you really shouldn't. Isn't the hunting cabin somewhere around here? Yeah, I think I know where it is. Hey, let's buzz the guy. Yeah, let's buzz him good. <laughs> Sometimes it's peer pressure from having a friend or family member traveling with you that you don't want to disappoint. Buzzing is illegal, ladies. Oh. Because pilots are very goal-oriented, it's often simply the pressure you put on yourself to complete a particular task, the flight that you've planned. In our case, our desire to prove to ourselves and to others the utility of general aviation airplanes occasionally had us flying when we really shouldn't have been. The external pressures on a pilot tend to lurk in the background, but they underlie everything he or she does. A quick scan of an external pressures checklist makes sure that you think about the issues and actually make a decision about them and that you don't accidentally put yourself in a dangerous or stressful situation. Now, after you've created your personal minimums checklist, you should plan on changing it from time to time. You may not fly for a while and lose proficiency. On the other hand, you may have had some recent training or experience and are a lot sharper than you were when you originally set your minimums. In either case, you need to readjust them. So put a date on your checklist and periodically revise your minimums and add a new date. Now a good rule to follow is that you can always increase your minimums at any time, but that you should only reduce your minimums when a positive event, such as an increase in experience or more training, maybe an instrument competency check has occurred. One thing though, Make sure you change your personal minimums sometime when you're not planning a particular flight. Otherwise, the external pressures of that flight will influence you. Just be sure to question yourself about your reasons and timing for the change. When we're done today, you'll have your own personal tailor-made checklist. But it won't do you very much good unless you really use it. So here's how you'll use it. Carry it with you in your flight kit. When you've gotten your weather and planned the route for your trip, pick up the checklist and glance through it just the way you would a checklist in an airplane. Of course, everything may not apply on every trip, and no checklist can cover every situation, but you'll find that with practice, you'll get better at spotting the risk factors in a given situation. And the checklist will be especially helpful in spotting the subtle risk factors that are often the most dangerous, like the ones caused by external pressures. Using the checklist will help make sure you think through the most important pre-flight and in-flight decisions instead of leaving them to the chance. One other thing. Pilots often say that usually no one thing causes an accident. It takes several things that finally add up to an accident. And if you can break that building chain, you can prevent the accident. Well, that's true. So here's what you should watch for. If you have an item that's marginal in a single risk factor category, that might not be so bad. But if you have items in more than one category, you could be headed for trouble and not even know it. We call the compounding effect from multiple categories of risk factors the cumulative effect. The cumulative effect is the insidious cause of most accidents. So here's a rule that you should make. If you have marginal items in two or more risk factor categories, don't go. If you're marginally tired, but everything else is okay, you might be able to safely make the decision to go. But if you're marginally tired and the weather is marginal, then that's a no-go. The cumulative effect is also significant in the air. If, for instance, you're marginally low on fuel and the weather's getting marginal, that's a signal to take action now. And by the way, 
one of the cumulative factors can be stress that you feel as a result of a problem with the aircraft, the environment, or external pressures. If you're feeling significant stress, that's very debilitating, and your performance will go downhill significantly. The stress itself now becomes a risk factor of its own, and you've ended up with two risk factors in two categories. So once again, if you have marginal items in two or more risk factor categories, take action. On the ground, make the decision not to go. In the air, make the decision to get on the ground now. Having this rule in advance and following it is the very best way to deal with the sneaky effect. Now that you know how you'll use this tool, let's get started making your own personal minimums checklist. Hi, how can I help you? Hi, uh, my wife and I flew in last night in 172 and we're on our way to New Mexico and Arizona, but I've never flown in the mountains before, so I was wondering if maybe you had a flight instructor who could give me some tips with my flight planning? I'm sure we do, let me check. Okay. I'll go to the restaurant and get some sandwiches to take with us. Perfect, I'll meet you back here. This is Bill Johnson. Hey Bill, Bob Walters. Hi Bob. Jane tells me you're looking for a flight instructor with some mountain flying experience. Exactly. Well, I think I can help. Let's sit down where we can talk. Okay. I've developed a personal minimums checklist that I use before each flight. Hmm. And going over this made me realize just how much I needed some information about mountain flying before I headed any further west. Plus, I know I'm flying a non-turbocharged, relatively low-powered aircraft and I wanted to get some tips on how to deal with that lack of performance at higher altitudes. Good idea. Let's take a look at the route you've planned. Okay. I figured we'd head west out of El Paso, of course, right over the road here into Deming, from Deming into Silver City, and then follow this... Well, I think you'll do fine if you wait a day for the winds to calm down. And take that lower route by way of Sakura we talked about. Yeah, and I like your idea of going into St. John's Airport instead of Springerville. It's 1,200 feet lower, Plus, it's a lot further from Baldy Peak and those nasty downdrafts you talked about. Not only that, it's pretty close to Jim and Sue's house, too. We'll have fun. Thanks to you, we will. How'd it go? Uh, great. It was a real eye-opener, though. How's that? Well, I guess I wasn't as ready for this flight as I thought. Bill asked me some questions about leaning the mixture, and there were some other things that I really didn't understand. See, I thought when you are flying at full throttle, you weren't supposed to lean the mixture. It turns out that at higher altitudes, you have to lean the mixture no matter how full the throttle. Wow, I'm glad you learned so much. Yeah, so am I, but there's more. Oh. You know, he also mentioned that when you're flying in high winds, you can get these serious downdrafts on the lee side of a mountain or a ridge. I hadn't even thought of that. Oh, and he also said that Virga, the rain that doesn't reach the ground, that can cause downdrafts. When the rain comes down, it meets the dry air below and it evaporates. That cools the air and it makes it heavier. Well, that heavier air sinks. See, we don't have Virga at home. And I never realized you can get in a downdraft just by flying under it. Wow, that's good to know. Well, I got the sandwiches and I'm ready to go. Well, that's another thing I've got to tell you. What's that? Uh, we're not going today. Hmm. There's some serious winds out there, and it's forecast to be almost completely calm tomorrow. We're going to have a lot smoother ride if we wait. Well, you know me. I'm all for the smooth flight. Hey, let's take that drive into Mexico we talked about. Okay, you're on. You know, Kathy, I'm actually kind of glad we decided to leave so early in the morning. Yeah, it's nice and cool. In fact, yesterday, Bill suggested I call ahead to St. John's and speak to an instructor there. You know, I'll get some information about the local flying area. Well, while I was at it, I decided to uh, schedule us a rental car. That way, when we get there, we can just drive down to Jim and Sue's, and they don't have to wait for us at the airport. Yeah, that'll take the pressure off. What are you doing? Oh, just taking one last look at my personal minimums checklist. You sure spend a lot of time looking at that thing. Well, not really, Kathy. But I'll tell you one thing, though. I have a funny feeling that this little checklist saved us from a lot of trouble yesterday. <laughs> what a great day to fly. One of the things we've learned from being pilots and from knowing pilots is that supposedly smart people, as all we pilots are, can do some really dumb things. Your personal minimums checklist. 
It's designed to help keep you from doing dumb things, at least around an airplane. We encourage you, keep your personal minimums checklist up to date and use it. Your flying will be more fun and less stressful. Plus, you can reasonably assure your family and other passengers that they can be confident of a safe and comfortable trip. In fact, use this checklist and you'll almost guarantee yourself something all pilots want, an equal number of takeoffs and landings. Well, not counting the bounces, of course. Folks, have fun in your flying.